Hey there, chemists. In this lesson, we're going to look specifically at one type of substitution reaction called the SN2 reaction. There's an animation of one on your screen right now, and there's a couple of things I want you to notice. Firstly, it's a concerted reaction. That means that the bond that breaks and the bond that forms is happening at the same time. It's all in one step. There's no intermediate. You just go via this transition state. The second thing I want you to notice is that there's an inversion of the geometry around the carbon where the substitution is happening. It starts out tetrahedral, it ends up tetrahedral, but the transition state halfway between is actually trig planar, so you get what's called an inversion of stereochemistry, and that's always true in the SN2 mechanism. So let's go to our notes and write down a few things about this reaction. First of all, the SN2 uh, stands for a uh, substitution that is nucleophilic and bimolecular. And this is what we see with halides that are primary halides or methyl halides, very unsubstituted halides. So we're going to focus exclusively on those in this lesson. Uh, the example we just saw, I'll use it as a main example, was a cyanide ion. Here's what cyanide looks like, lone pair on the carbon the nitrogen triple bond in between and a formal charge on the carbon that's acting as our nucleophile, nuke. And our electrophile was bromomethane, which I'll draw out completely. That's our electrophile. And they turn into a transition stage. That's what we saw, which I'm going to put in a pair of big square brackets where the cyanide starts to form a bond with the carbon undergoing substitution at the same time as the bromine is leaving. So you don't have an intermediate. That's not what this is. This is called a transition state. Transition state. And it's just the word we use to describe the species that's in between the reactant and the product. Uh, it's that high energy spot on a reaction energy diagram, which we'll draw in a second to illustrate this. Uh, this gave us our product. leaving group. And just make a note that there is inversion, and it's this transition state that explains that inversion of stereochemistry. I can't tell in this example. That's not an asymmetric carbon. But if it was, we'd be able to see that inversion of stereochemistry. Okay, so we said that this was nucleophilic. That's why there's nucleophile coming in. This is a substitution reaction. What do we mean by bimolecular? Uh, bimolecular refers to the kinetics of this reaction. So if we were studying the rate of this reaction, bimolecular means it depends on the concentration of both reactants. So the rate would be a rate constant, K, times the concentration of cyanide and bromomethane. Not all reactions depend on the concentration of each species, or the rate doesn't always depend on the concentration of everything, but bimolecular reactions depends on two things, and there's only two things in this reaction. Speaking of rates, that makes me think of energy diagrams. So let's look at an energy diagram for this and show why it's concerted. Remember, you can have some arbitrary place where your energy starts, and relative to that, it goes to some product energy. So there's reactants, there's products. I'm arbitrarily making this exothermic. I actually don't know if this reaction is endo or exo. Concerted means there's only one crest in your energy diagram, and that's where your transition state shows up. There's no intermediate concerted. Okay, so that's an overview of the SN2 reaction. Let's look at some common things we see with this uh, and then look at a few examples. First of all, um, what makes for a good leaving group in an SN2 reaction? Well, for the most part, we're gonna see things like the halogens. So those are our most common because as we said in the previous lesson, we've recently learned how to make alkyl halides by substitutions via radical reactions. Uh, they're usually good when they are weak bases, so things that are stable on their own. So chloride, bromide, iodide, these are all the conjugate base of a strong acid, and that means they're very stable and, and act as good leaving groups. Off to the left, you have pretty bad leaving groups. We're not going to see things like hydroxide or alkoxides or even fluoride act as good leaving groups. All the way to the right, we have a really good one called the tosylate, uh, which is just an example of a sulfate. Uh, an organic sulfate that looks like that it just happens to be a very good leaving group. It's uh, 
stable on its own. There's actually lots of resonance stability with that anion, so you can even make sense of why it's a pretty good leaving group. Below that, I have some good nucleophiles. Nucleophiles are things that are electron-rich. They all have lone pairs in them, so the sulfide anion, the cyanide ion we just saw, uh, iodide has lone pairs around it, doesn't it? Sulfide actually has three on it, doesn't it? Uh, alkoxides are good nucleophiles. Hydroxide is a good nucleophile. Bromide, even things that are neutral like ammonia with its lone pair, etc., etc. So as long as it's got a lone pair and it's willing to give it up in a substitution reaction, it makes a good nucleophile. There's four things I want to jot down related to nucleophiles that help us rank when something is a better nucleophile. First of all, bases are always better than their respective conjugate acids. So if you're just comparing two things and they're a conjugate pair of each other, such as hydroxide and water, hydroxide is the better nucleophile. It's the base of that conjugate pair. Secondly, less electronegative atoms, less electro neg atoms. For example, bromide versus fluoride. Look at your periodic table. Fluorine is at the top on the right. That's the most electronegative element on the table. Bromine is a couple of rows down, so that is less electronegative, and it is therefore a better nucleophile. Remember what electronegativity means. It means that you are polarizing electrons toward yourself when you share them in a covalent bond. So an atom that's not very electronegative is more willing to give up its electron pair and form a bond in the substitution. Similar to that would be the atomic size. So larger atoms make for a good nucleophile. Uh, for example, phosphine, pH3, compared to ammonia, NH3. Phosphorus is a larger atom. Its valence electrons are farther from the nucleus. It's more capable of going and forming a bond. So that's a better nucleophile. And then lastly, less steric crowding makes for a good nucleophile. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's consider diethylamine, which looks like that, as opposed to triethylamine, which looks like that. Both of these are nitrogen atoms. They both have lone pairs that are available to go form bonds. They're, they're both nitrogen, so they have the same electronegativity. But the diethylamine is a much better nucleophile than triethylamine simply because it doesn't have these uh, flailing ethyl groups attached to it that are getting in the way of forming a bond. So triethylamine is a much better base uh, than acting as a nucleophile and attaching itself to something. Okay, so let's move on to some examples and wrap this up. This time, uh, you'll notice the products are not given to us. We have to figure out what the products are going to be, but I'm telling you all of these are SN2 reactions. So how do you figure out the product of one of these? Well, first, find the carbon attached to a leaving group, which is usually going to be a halogen. So I'm looking at that carbon right there. That's your electrophile. And specifically, that's your electrophilic position. Because that leaving group is pulling electron density away from it, that must mean the other molecule is your nucleophile. Where is it nucleophilic? The most electron-rich spot, all the lone pairs on that oxygen atom. Once you've identified where your electrophilic atom is, nucleophilic atom is, draw an arrow from the nucleophilic atom to the electrophilic atom, and then show another arrow with the leaving group leaving, in this case from the carbon-bromine bond to the bromine itself. And then I simply draw what my curved arrows show me took place in terms of what bond broke and what bond formed. Looks like I still have those two carbons attached to an oxygen, but now the oxygen is attached to another carbon on the other side, and then there's just a bromide floating around. So those are my products of that. You get an ether. You now know how to make an ether from the conjugate base of an alcohol. Right below it, let's do the same thing. Find the carbon attached to the leaving group. That's the molecule on the right. And the more ele electrophilic atom is the carbon itself. The nucleophile must be the other molecule. Where is it nucleophilic? The lone pairs on the nitrogen make me highlight the nitrogen atom. So draw an arrow from the nitrogen to the carbon. And then there's another arrow that shows the carbon iodine bond breaking. You just get a free iodide ion. So what I have is this entire six-membered ring with a nitrogen in it. This is called a pyridine ring. And then the nitrogen is now attached to a CH3. All those hydrogens are along for the ride. Nothing changed in there. I have my iodide, 
And that looks good, but there's one other thing that's missing. If you look at that, there's now a formal charge on the nitrogen. The charge has to be balanced. Nitrogen four bonds and no lone pairs, it's a formal charge of plus one. So those are some methyl halides, bromomethane and iodomethane. They work great in SN2 substitutions. Primary halides work just as well. They're very they're, they're very sterically roomy. They are not sterically crowded. Uh, so forming a bond with a carbon attached to a leaving group when it's primary is easy to do. So I look at uh, A, I find my leaving group. That's the electrophile. The electrophilic atom is the carbon attached to the bromine. That means that this other thing is my nucleophile. The most electron-rich spot would be the sulfur. Draw an arrow from the nucleophilic atom to the electrophilic atom. Draw another arrow showing the leaving group leaf. And now i got to figure out what my products look like. So I have most of this molecule still intact. So I'm going to draw that part first, because most of that's the same. But now this carbon here is attached to my sulfur. So I have a new bond attached to a sulfur. And whatever was attached to the sulfur already is still there. There's an ethyl group. You mean a sulfide, a sulfur version of an ether. And then I have a bromide as a leaving group. Eventually, we're not even going to draw the leaving group separately. It's inorganic. We are mostly concerned with just the organic product, the carbon-containing stuff. Last one, find the carbon attached to the leaving group. That's the first molecule. That's your electrophile. And there it is. Um, the other molecule, therefore, must be our nucleophile. Which part of this thing is nucleophilic? Well, that's an ionic compound. That's Na plus and I minus. So it's the iodide. That's my nucleophile. So draw an arrow from the iodide to that carbon, and another arrow from the carbon to the chloride. That gives me, looks like, two, four, five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. Now attached to an iodine. And then I have Na plus still floating around. And if you want, you can just coordinate it to the Cl. If you drew a curved arrow from this bond to the sodium, that's not necessarily correct because you don't actually form a covalent bond between those two species. It's an ionic bond. So just drawing it to the atom itself is, is a little bit better. All right, so those are some examples of the SN2 reaction. A little more details about the kinds of trends we'll see related to nucleophiles and leaving groups. And the key things to remember are that you get an inversion of stereochemistry, uh, which we haven't seen in any of these examples because none of these have asymmetric carbons. But if we look at this with a secondary, we'll see some inversions of stereochemistry. We'll get to that in future lessons.